It's time for another Dice Tower review with the Game Boy Geek. Hello my friends, it's the Game Boy Geek here. Today we're going back to the early 1800s. We're gonna be getting our canoes. We're gonna be going down the Missouri River. We're gonna be trying to explore all the way to the Pacific Ocean. We're gonna be going through crazy rapids. We're gonna be going through huge high mountains. We're gonna to have to come in contact and friend with over 50 Indian tribes to try to make this journey. We're talking about Lewis and Clark here. A one to five player game from Ludonaut, uh, brought to the US through Asmodee. Uh, it's uh, one to five players. It's 30 minutes per player, ages 14 and up. Uh, it is a pretty straightforward Euro game with some interesting mechanics. Let's take a look at this historic European game and let's take a look and I'll see you on the other side and I'll show you what I finally think. At the beginning of the game, everyone selects a color and they get six starting cards and a little mini board that they can hold resources in, Indians and such on. Um, and everyone gets six cards of the same mechanic type. But if we look at this card here that gets us some wood and we look at other colors of this same mechanical card, actually as the, the different colors of the uh, players, the cards and the names of the cards and the people that do those actions are actually different which is really cool because every sort of player has their own little cards, even though they do sort of the same thing to start with. And so whether you're going for food or fur or equipment or wood or doing interpreting or commanding, they're all different between the people um, by looks and feel, even though the mechanics are the same, and that really makes every player feel special. And also at the beginning of the game, you get sort of this board here that can hold different resources. Uh, the, the right spaces hold uh, Indians. This, anytime we see a regular circle, you can hold one. Anytime you see a semicircle, you can, you can put uh, an, an unlimited amount of there. We'll talk about what some of these things do later, but each one gets that board. And here we see the main board, which what we're trying to do is get from St. Louis down through the water, through the mountains, through the water, through the mountains, and have a camp at Fort uh, Clatsop. And the first person that camps there is the winner. So on your turn, you have to do one action, mandatory or compulsory action, and then you could do a couple optional things. Let's talk about the regular actions first. One of the two things you could do is play one of these cards. So let's talk a little bit closer what these cards do. Now you'd have all these at the hand at the beginning of the game, and let's say I wanted to play this action. This would give me one food uh, for every food symbol that we see on my player board and anybody on the player to my left or my right. Now when you play a card, you have to activate it. And when you activate it, all these cards have backsides with a different amount of strength to them. Also the strength is notated here, so this is a strength of one and it will have one strength on the back. So what you have to do is take another card from your, uh, your deck there and you would put it behind it so that we see that this card has to be activated and this is in case a strength of one. Uh, if it had a, you know, two Indians on it, it'd be a strength of two. It allows you to activate the card twice and so on and so forth. So you're activating this card once. So for every one of these uh, symbols that we see on mine and my neighbors, uh, one of my neighbors may have played their food card earlier from a different player. He's yellow, I'm orange. And this might be on his player board. And in this case, I would get one, two uh, food essentially, which is the pink. And I would put these in my boats which I showed you in the beginning. Now, if this had a strength of two or three, this would get activated differently. So if we had this and this was a strength of two, then it would be basically doing it twice. So instead of just getting two, we would get four because it's getting activated twice. One, two, three, four, it's gonna activate four. And then we get four food. And that's sort of how activating works. Now you do start with an Indian. If you want, you can power up the card even further. And in this case, this would get activated three times. So instead of getting two or four, I'm gonna be getting six because there's two of them, one for my neighbor, one for me. Uh, and we're activating it three times. So two times three is six. We would get six of those pink food. That's the general mechanic of playing cards and strengthening those. And mechanically, it's the same for fur or equipment or wood. Now the other card is here. This will allow us, again, you always have to uh, activate a card when you play one, but let's say we played this with a strength of one. Uh, this would allow us to pay either one food and move two spots up the river, one canoe, which we'll talk about later, four spots on the river, or one horse and go to mountain spaces. So let's say we had two, uh, we had one of these and we were gonna, we would basically spend it. We put it back in the stockpile and we'd be able to move up twice on the river. 
So my orange guy would go one, two. This is where I am now. These spots are the colors and this is where their camp is because as things go on, it's kind of like a, a, a milestone marker where my camp is back here, but we're moving up and hopefully we're gonna be continuing to move that camp up with us over the game. Now, before I show you what the last card, starting card does, let's talk about the board. Instead of playing a card, another thing you could do is play an Indian on a board. And this is pretty much like worker placement. Anywhere there's a full circle, only one Indian can be there. If they have semicircles, an unlimited amount can be there. And when you place there, you can place anywhere from one to three Indians in these spots at a time, but they can hold an unlimited amount. Some of them are semicircles. And let's talk a little bit about these actions. And this one would get you either two food or two wood, one equipment, one wood, one food, one fur. You can spend two uh, wood to get a canoe, which as we saw earlier, helped you move up the river. And some other spots are trading three resources that are all different kinds to get a horse that helps you get through the mountains. Here's you can pay a food to activate a card on any area, either my area or one of my two players that's there, which is kind of cool. Here you can pay three food to either get a boat upgrade uh, for Indians or for uh, resources. Now these do different things. Obviously you can put two different resources there. They're double sided. So if you want, you can hold more, but it will hurt you when you camp. We'll talk about that later. So you can pick which one and which side you want, whether you want to hold three or one, but this one may be negative uh, later. I'll show you that. You can pick which one and then add it to your boats. So since if you wanted to do that, you go to that spot and you could add that there. And now you have an extra spot. And the last action on the spot is you go there, you discard three cards from your hand out of your hand for the rest of the game. And you basically, the entire market of new characters that's available for purchase, uh, for recruiting, you basically wipe the entire market. So again, the compulsory action you have to do is either play a card with strength or play an Indian or Indians on the board. You get one move. And then optionally, one of the things you can do, uh, either before or after that, you can recruit one of these characters, and this is the sideway board. Let's take a closer look at it head on. These cards just allow you, they add to your deck and they allowed you to do certain things. Like for example, you could, if you own this guy, you could trade in two equipment to move three spaces on the water, or you could trade in two equipment to get a horse, which will then help you move on the mountains. Or you could trade in food to move for the water or food to move on the mountains. These guys just do all sorts of different things that help you build your engine. To buy these cards, it shows you cost. We have a one equipment and one fur. And likewise, we have two equipment and four fur. And as you see, the fur cost gets less as these slide down and they get bought up. And the amount of equipment is always shown on the number there of the strength of that card. Uh, you can also use discard one of the cards out of your hand for the rest of the game if you want to use it as part of the purchase of the, of the card. So this one's one equipment and two fur. I have a card in my hand that if I wanted to discard it, I can use it for one equipment because it is a strength of one card. So I could discard this, but I never get it back in the game and I could use that to pay for this instead of actually shelling out equipment resources, which of course are the silver, the, the gray ones. Uh, and you might even sometimes use a card that's a strength of two to discard out of your hand for the rest of the game because it might allow you to buy, uh, use two equipment. So I wouldn't have to pay any equipment here if I discard this card. So sometimes you may want to discard cards, although sometimes it can be a little risky to do so. And when one gets bought, these all slide on there and that's recruiting a character. Now let's talk about the last mandatory action uh, card that you start with that I did not mention. And now let's say someone had played some of these Indians. Now the amount of Indians that start in the stockpile depends on how many players there are. But let's say these were out there. There's three out there, uh, there. And someone plays the interpreter card uh, on, their, on their mat with some strength. So this essentially, activating it once, allows me to move all the Indians on the board to the powwow section, take as many as I want, and then I have to discard the lowest card in the recruitment deck. So I would take all these Indians, I would put them in the center, I would take as many as I want. In this case, maybe I take all of them. I then add one to this, what's called the newcomer spot. And I would add these to my board. Now this spot can only hold one. This spot can hold as many as I want. And then we would discard that card and move the market down and refill it like that. So the mandatory actions is playing a card with strength or playing on the board. And then optionally, you could recruit a character. The other optional move you can do on your turn is camping. So let's say, let's take a little closer look over here. Now everyone's camp still at the beginning, but people have started to move up uh, as moving down the river. And let's say I wanted to camp. This is where these sun symbols come in. Let's say I had two cards still in my hand when I tried, when I said, I'm going to camp. Any cards you have in your hand, basically they each all have one of these suns on them, the suns. So that's two of them total. Now here, let's say I had a, a resource here and here. So this tells me if I have even one resource here, I have to, uh, basically there's another sun symbol. And here there's one sun symbol for every resource. So if I had two of these here, this would be two, three, 
And then this is one for every Indian in this spot. So this would be two, three, four, and five for this whole area, plus this and this is six and seven. That would mean when I camped, I would actually move back seven spots. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then my camp would get set. I mean, yes, my camp moved up, but it didn't move up as far as I really wanted it to. So maybe before I moved up, I ended up using both of these resources and both of these Indians, and maybe I just still had these three. So I would have one, two, three to camp. Sometimes you want to camp with none of these symbols if you can, but sometimes you really want to cycle through your deck fast, so you'll take a few points to go backwards. So in this case, I would have just gone back three, and I would put my camp there. The winner of the game is the one that ends up getting their camp at least to Fort Clatsop. The first one there, it's a racing game. The game ends immediately, and they are the ones that win. Now, some of these spots are, you know, move from wa um, water to mountains, and of course you need different resources to get there. Some of them have both water and mountains, and you can use either, uh, you know, a water movement or a mountain movement on those, but eventually you're just trying to see who the first one to get move their camp all the way up there. The first one that does that is the winner. All right, well, there's Lewis and Clark. I usually love games that have historical themes. I actually watched a documentary on Lewis and Clark in preparation for playing this game just to see how closely to the theme did that match. Uh, and I know a lot of Euro games get really hit on hard for, hey, they, they're pasted on theme, the theme doesn't work well. Um, and in this Euro game, I actually think the theme's great. I love the historic aspect. They have a lot of history in the rule book, which I absolutely loved, uh, and the different cards. So let's go through the things I liked about the game. Um, I loved how all the different uh, six, uh, five players had the same mechanical cards to start with, but they were all different. They felt different. They looked different. The artwork on the cards and such were amazing. I loved how, uh, you know, just historically you're trying to get through uh, to, to that fort to end the game. And so it had a lot to think about. Um, there's a lot of things to think about in your turn, uh, which is good. Uh, for me, this was a solid game with some, some interesting mechanics, with the powering up and activating the cards one, two, or three times, or going on the board. And I think these unique, in, uh, I don't have a game like this where those mechanics were really were very unique um, to the game and to each other. Uh, so I really liked that aspect of it because it did feel like nothing else I'd ever played before. Um, and, and it was solid mechanically. There's, you know, a few minor things I could call about the mechanics, like, you know, you buy another card and now you have an odd, an odd number of cards in your hand and then you can never really have like a perfect camp where you don't go back any. And it just seemed like sometimes I was, I was fighting against parts of the game that really shouldn't be beating me down. But that's a minor quabble. Uh, the game mechanically was pretty sound other than that, the, that minor complaint. Um, we're, so overall, I, I think the game is solid. Uh, I think Euro gamers and hardcore Euro gamers are going to love this game. And I've seen how it's on a lot of top 10 from 2013 lists of some of those Euro gamers. That is a testament to me echoing that Euro gamers are probably going to really like this game. Uh, for me, it felt too much like work. Um, which isn't a bad thing because like a game like Sleuth, which I love a lot, feels like work. When I'm done with that game, my brain is tired, I need to take a rest, but I love it. This one felt like work. Um, but, it, but that brings me to the next thing, which is it just felt almost too long. Um, now, it says 30 minutes per player, and of course, that probably is if you're playing with all experienced players. Um, I, I think this game is best with two or three. Three, you have neighbors on both sides. I think that's the sweet spot of this game. You have neighbors on both sides, so those cards make sense. You're not just uh, looking at, your, at the other one player with a two-player game. Um, anything more than three, for me, the game just takes too long. And it's not like a five or six hour game, it's 30 minutes. So you play with four people and if even one person is not new or has any type of AP at all, even a little bit, you're talking about two and a half hours. And for me, I don't know, as I get older, for games, the longer the game, the more amazing it has to be for it to get to the table. Like you take games like Power Grid and Nothing Personal, two of my favorite games, they're both two and a half hour games at least. And even loving those games and having in my top 10 in all my games, they still don't get to the table nearly as much as anybody really wants to because they're long. So when you have a game like this that's good, it's solid, it's a good game, but it's two and a half hours if there's four people, for me it's like uh, it has to be so amazing for it to get out and it probably just won't. So maybe as a two player game, possibly of a three, if everyone's played before we can move faster. Uh, I would probably play this more often. Otherwise, it's probably just not going to get the table as much as I would like, which is sad because it is a good game. Um, also, the AP potential here, 
is really bad. The downtime can be huge because in this game, there's so many options and so many different ways you can build your engine. And then you're going from water to mountain and you have to kind of switch your engine. And then from mountains to water, you're switching back. There's so many things to think about, so many different areas or things that you can do on your turn. And depending on what other people do, you might have a couple things you might want to do, but somebody else played a card that really will help you because you can play a card that activates his or this and that. So you don't know exactly what you're going to do on your turn until it's your turn. And then you have so many choices that people with AP are going to take forever in this game. And that might, that's the only downside. So it is a great, it is a good game, solid game, interesting mechanics, great theme, great artwork. I love it, but it's probably just not going to get to the table too much. It just takes too long. AP, downtime. That's just my thought, but it is a solid game. If you're a Euro gamer, you're probably going to love this one. Lewis and Clark. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com. <laughs>